like to let it show. Welcome to Fountain Pen Radio, presented by FBGeeks.com. And now for your Fountain Pen enthusiast hosts, here's Eric and Dan. Gentlemen. This is Fountain Pen Geeks podcast, episode number 41 for Tuesday, September 18th, 2012. We are recording live on Saturday, September 15th. Welcome to Fountain Pen Radio. This is Stephen, September 15th. Welcome to Fountain Pen Radio. This is Stephen. And this is Dan. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulties. Um, As I'm sure you're aware, um, Eric is not with us this morning. Um, Something's come up at the last minute, so it will just be the two of us today. Um, Stephen, how are you doing over there? Um, I I am right now doing okay. And this morning, I set myself on fire. Uh, so that's uh, that was fairly spectacular. And um, um, what what happened was that I and because it's really true, uh, I um, I I was thinking about the, the the lemon juice. And when you write with that, you can't see it. And then you hold it to a flame, and and you you it, it shows up. Well, instead of using a candle as normal people do, I use one of those those butane torches. I thought that would be a good idea. And the the, the writing it showed up fantastically. It was gorgeous. It was deep. Dark brown. I used um, uh, Gela Lo uh, champagne colored paper, um, and when I was while I was reading it, I thought, "What's that black spot?" And apparently, the paper caught fire. So it was <laughs> smoldering. It was there was fire, and before I knew it, there was like ten inch flames coming from the paper. And I thought, "Oh no!" Wow. So I just got up, ran to the bathroom, really, you know, hit my foot very badly on the stairs, and I ended up like this. My thumb was burned. It's not too serious but it did hurt quite a bit so you know the day started fantastically and I'm very happy to be here now so well, what about you I I don't have anything that can compare to that so um, <laughs> fortunately I think we should just go right into the pen shows <laughs> yeah I think that's a good idea so the first one uh, that we got coming up that's actually going on this weekend that uh, we I just found out about is the Valencia pen show and okay. uh, September 14th through the 16th, it's, uh, I guess it's a fairly small show. They, they do have a website. Check out our pin show page for more information there. Um, they have pictures of previous year's pin show. So there's, you know, pretty cool images to look at there if you're near the Valencia area. Um, lucky you. But, uh, Stephen, how, how far away is Valencia? Valencia, for me. Uh, that would be uh, a multiple hour thing. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, it's uh, more than a thousand kilometers, so that's that's quite a bit. So it'd be a trip then. It would definitely be a trip. Yes. Well, uh, for those of you in the states, the Dallas show is coming up September 21st and 22nd. It's only five dollars to get in the door there. Um, we know Mike Masuyama will be there as well as a number of other people. Uh, check out our uh, pin show page for the website to that show. And Michigan is coming up the week after that, September 28th and 29th. The Tilburg show will be September 29th. And there's no website for that show. But, Stephen, you're planning on going to that, right? I am planning on going, yes. And I, I um, uh, want to see if I can shoot some video there and if I can at least have an, an interview with one person who's like a major pen seller in the Netherlands. I think that would be nice. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And then uh, the first show in October is the San Francisco Pen Show, October 5 through 7. And they do have a website, sanfranciscopenshow.net. Check that out for more information. And we'll be given more details as that show approaches. Sounds cool. So let's... let's, We we won't have any geeks at the, the San Fran show. No, that's uh, that's a pity. I mean, but I'm sure that there is someone in the audience, someone, someone you know, um, active on the website who would go there. Maybe they can send us some um, pictures, impressions, etc. Yeah, we'll have like a, a, a remote location reporter. Exactly. It's like our, our personal geek on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So you All right. Top pins. Yes, let's do so. All right, so the first one is from Nakaya, and give me just a second to pull this up. It's that's a butterfly-like pen, right? Exactly. Um, this pen, it's 
the, the inspiration came from the, the blue bottle uh, swallowtail butterfly, usually found in South and Southeast Asia, though it is found in other parts of the world. The, the wings, they have done a fantastic job representing the wings. If you look at pictures of this butterfly, it, it looks almost just like it. They're, they're made from Raiden, and the base of the pen is, is black ebonite with uh, black arushi. And then to create the actual butterfly itself, they use the sumiko technique, which uses uh, charcoal powder built up in stages, and it, it gives it like a, a fine granular texture. And then they've added also some more Raiden work at the bottom of the pen. And I, I love pens with Raiden work. I mean, it's just, just so beautiful. I think it's really, really nice. And you, you um, put, I think, a link in the, on the website uh, where people can actually see some, some close-ups of the, uh, the, the, the butterfly that's on there. Um, I, I think it's very, very impressive. It's, it's like almost iridescent or something. It's, it's really, really nice what they did with that. I really love that. Yeah. The, we, we do have a price at their website. Um, th this pen sells for $6,000, which is kind of be expected for a pen with Raiden work, just because it's, it's so time intensive. Um, I don't know. That, that price didn't really shock me. What, what about you, Stephen? Did, did that kind of make the eyes pop out of your head there? Uh, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's probably not something I would spend on a pen, but considering the, the amount of detail that, that and, and, and amount of work that went into there and, and you know, that, that what they ended up with, I think that's, a, that's a, a decent price for such artistry. And so uh, we did have another hands-on this, yes. Um, did, did you have a chance to, to read it, Stephen? Yes, I did, and I, I liked it. Um, I, I uh, do not own an M600. Uh, this was the Pelican M600 White Tortoise and the M205 Duo Highlighter. Uh, I, I, I do have an M205, uh, and I, I really like the, the, the hands-on feature because it does, for me, it does just that. It gives you the impression that you're really, you know, well, I won't say touching the pen, but really, you, know, you really get practical information about the pen. I, I, I really like that. Um, I also saw that you, uh, I think you got the, uh, Mike Masayama worked on the M600 nib. Is that correct? Yeah, I did at the 2012 Chicago Pen Show. He, he turned it into a stub for me. And that looks very, very nice. Um, and the, the, the M205 uh, nib, I, 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 uh, that is the, the double broad nib, I, I do own that. I, don't, I haven't turned that into a stub as, as you did, um, but I think it's a nice pen. So what, what do you think about these two pens in, in brief? Well, the, let's see, the, the M205 highlighter, I bought that a long time ago um, just because of the ridiculous nib in it, and I, and I had a lot of credit at the online store where I purchased it from, so that was kind of okay. a no brainer there. And then the white tortoise, I mean, I love that color combination. So as soon as I saw it was even available, I had it imported from Germany like a week or two before it was available in the States. Um, I got that in a, in a double broad as well. Um, I, I just absolutely love that color combination. I, I love the, the intense yellow of the highlighter. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's absolutely right. It's 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 undeniably yellow. I mean, that's a, a really God. yellow pen, but it's it's, it's for like some reason to the sun. Yeah, exactly. But for some reason, I don't dislike it. It could be if it if it's yellow plastic, it could look strange or out of place. But I think with this pen, it's also because it's sort of the, the highlighter thing. I, I think it works. Yeah, I, I do too. Um, it, in the hand, I don't know these these two feel very very similar um e even okay. though there's about 20 millimeters difference in length when capped um th they still feel really similar to me um and i think the problem that i had with these pens is i, I picked the wrong nibs for them I, I picked nibs that should go in like an m1000 size you know something just a massive pen i think if i would have picked a fine or even an extra fine nib which is my daily you know writing nib that i write with a lot of cursive in i would have liked these pens a lot more um not to say that there was anything bad about them i mean you're getting the the quality that pelican is known for the piston mechanism is fantastic they yeah. hold a ton of ink um the the m205 holds 
one and a half milliliters of ink. The M600 holds two milliliters of ink. I mean, so, so you're not starving for capacity. The, the price isn't too bad on these. The, the M600 is a little steep. I mean, 475 MSRP, 380 street price. You know, what, what you're paying f for on the M600 is, is the gold nib and then kind of yeah. the ex exclusivity around the pen because it's only going to okay. be made for a limited time. They're not going to be widely available. And, you know, it's a color combination that, that people just love. So, but, but the M205, now that's got an MSRP of 150 street price of around 120 And, you know, you may not like this particular M200 series pen, but there are a lot of different designs in the 200 series. So uh, this, this would be a pen that I would easily recommend, like, everybody should have. Like, like if you don't like the Lamy 2000, this is my next recommendation for a fountain pen. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, 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 I'm thinking right now, I think I only own two Pelicans, and this was the first one I bought, because it's a nice sort of starter, it's a decent price, um, and it's it's just versatile. The, the shop where I bought it also uh, offered you to uh, add a, a second nib unit uh, at, at a very reasonable price, um, so that you, if you don't like the double broad, I think I took a medium, uh, and I never use it, but still, I mean, at the, at the time I thought, if this double broad is really ridiculously broad, then at least I have some backup. And if you can do something like that, I think it's a, it's a, a very good deal and a, a very, very decent price. Yes. And if the, the M600 White Tortoise doesn't suit you, um, Pelican has come out with the M605 Blue Stripe. And I actually have this pen in an M805, and the color combination is absolutely gorgeous. Um, the, the blue with, with the silver colored trim, I think, is one of the, the better combinations out there. Of course, this is the M605, so it's going to be the same size as the White Tortoise, um, and, and then quite a bit smaller than the M800. It, it's actually small enough that I, the M800 is the smallest Pelican that I would use. Um, right. The M605, it has a 14-karat gold nib. It'll be available in extra fine, fine, medium, or broad sizes. This is, of course, a piston filler. Um, MSRP is 450 on this. Street price is around 360 And they, they released this in the 605 because the, the 405 and the 805 series have, have done so well. It is a limited production pen. So you'll you'll have to if you want one you'll need to get it soon. I, I'm not sure they never say how long they produce these for or um, how how many they're gonna make. They they just call them limited productions. So I think it looks very nice. I think that I mean the the I I don't dislike the the, the pelican green and of course it's like a, a, you know a typical trademark thing that that makes you recognize these pens. But I do think the blue is very, very nice. I think it's a very nice, uh, at least from what I see in the pictures, I, I, it looks like a very intense blue color. And I, I think that's uh, that's very cool. And then the, the, the sort of silver colored highlighting, I think that that's, maybe I like that better than the gold, actually. Yeah, I think with the green, the, the gold fits okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I really like the, the blue and silver trim just so much more. Should we uh, move on to something else which has like chrome trim stuff going on? What would that be, Stephen? Uh, I don't know, something uh, Visconti-ish? Yeah. Um, so they came out with um, quite a few new products, starting with two new pins, the, the Opera and Blue Typhoon and Crystal Demonstrator, but then they're releasing this with a smart touch tubular nib and a mosquito ink adapter. And this has only been out for a couple of weeks and there's a lot of mixed reactions to this. Um, so, so the nib, it's made from chromium 18. That's what they call it. And this is really just a, a version of steel a steel alloy with 18% chromium in it. That's really all that is. Um, don't think this is some special, you know, palladium nib or some new wonder metal because it's not. And it, it has kind of that, that waverly tip going on. There, there's a lot of laser engraving on the nib. And 
I'm not a huge fan of that look, but you know, I haven't seen it in person. So all, all I've seen right now are pictures. And then they've also come out with this mosquito adapter and they, they do have a, a video filling demonstration of that. But basically what it does is it gets put on the, the, the front of the pen and it'll only work with this nib. It only work with the, that, you know, tubular shaped nib. You push it on there, you fill the pen Supposedly, the advantage is you can get every last drop of ink out of the bottle. Um, it's it's cleaner for the nib, but yet you still have to clean the adapter. You actually have to rinse it. You can't just wipe it off. And it comes with the pens. Now, each of these pens will be limited to a thousand pieces each. They will come in nib sizes um, fine, medium, broad, and stub, which is pretty cool because Visconti stubs are are actually pretty awesome. They utilize Visconti's double reservoir filler, and retail on these is six ninety five for the Blue Typhoon and seven fifty for the Crystal Demonstrator. So, Stephen, what do you think about these? I, I think I love everything except for the price, probably. Um, but I, I, I think it's Visconti is always, you know, doing innovative stuff. I think, and and this. I think both pens look really cool, um, and this this mosquito thing. I mean, I'm not sure how it will work out, but I I'm, I'm assuming it will work out just fine. Um, I think it's it's very cool. The the tubular nibs. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that, or, you know, even remotely like that. Um, what I was trying to see, which is why I'm sort of squinting and, and looking at my screen, uh, is it. At, I thought at first there was a, a picture on the website of the, um, especially the demonstrator. It seems to be that the the nib slit there is no breather hole, but it, it it I thought for a second that the nib slit runs very deeply into the section, but I think that's actually just reflection. So it's it's probably not super flexy or anything. No, um, yeah, I think the the nib slit is is just kind of normal length, but no. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But I, you know, I, a, a friend of mine, a founder pen friend, at some point said, "I, I hate this county," and I said, "Really?" <laughs> and he said, "Yeah, I hate it because their pens are just too awesome." And I think, I mean, when I when I look at this, then I get that feeling again. I mean, it's I, it, it's it's very shiny. I don't necessarily care for that, but that that um, blue opera opera blue typhoon. I think that looks spectacular and I, I really love to see these in, in real life at some point so what about you yeah I would definitely have to get my hands on this to make you know a, a legitimate uh, opinion but but based just off pictures I mean obviously this is kind of an homage or a ripoff I guess depending on which side of the fence you sit of, of the Schaefer snorkel mm -hmm. um, I, I have one here so if, if you take a look at, at the nib <laughs> That no. looks like familiar, yeah. Yeah, it's it's got that, you know, the the triumph nib. That's what Schaefer mm -hmm. called it. Um, I, I think the design is a lot better on these. I, I particularly like on the back how, you know, the curve is much smoother. On the back of the Visconti's, it's angled down. It's shaped a little funny. I don't know. I don't, I don't so much like it. I, I really don't like the laser engraving on the nib. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then the snorkel part of it attaches to the pen. And I don't really like that either because now if, if I want to, you know, fill this pen without having to worry about getting the nib dirty, I have to bring this extra piece along with me wherever I'm at. Um, I have to be able to rinse it with water. Um, and, you know, it's, it's an extra piece to the package. So it's adding cost to the pen. I mean, but don't think it's not. They, they have to manufacture this somewhere. Sure. You know, we're paying for this. They're not just going to eat the cost of this thing. And it's it's a steel nib pen. Yeah, that's that's eight hundred and eighty dollars. Like, yeah. really? I mean, I understand it's a Visconti. I understand it's it uses their their double power filler. It's it's you know kind of a top of the range, you know, limited edition pen. That's fine, but it's it's a seven hundred dollar pen. I mean, yeah. make the introduction a little easier for people because it's such a new product. Right. Um, yeah, no, no, I I agree with that. I mean, I think it looks good. I'm not sure whether it's actually you know nice to use, but it, yeah, I I see your points. I definitely see your points. And really, I I should have thought of the snorkel, of course. I don't own one, so I didn't really have a, a frame of reference. But now that you've shown me this, yeah, okay, 
I see your point definitely. But, you know, having said all that, I do have to give huge props to Visconti for actually producing this because they're they take chances or, you know, they make things that a lot of other companies wouldn't even dare to, you know, think about doing. Right. And so you got to give props to Dante and, and Visconti for doing that. And like I said, I, you know, once I get my hands on this, I would so hope that it completely changes my thoughts about that. But, you know, just from looking at pictures, um, th those were my um, first thoughts. And I think, well, actually, I think that that attachment bit might be useful if you wanted to a bolt-on pen user. You can, <laughs> yeah, that, that may be, but apart from that, no, yeah, I see the point. Okay. Shall we um, talk about something else that's a little blue? The uh, yeah, encyclopedia? Um, <clears throat> sorry. I, uh, we, I did a new entry for the encyclopedia, which is on Pelican Turquoise. Uh, I think that's a, a fairly vibrant, nice ink color. Uh, I was actually surprised a little bit by it because I hadn't used that ink for a while. Um, and I thought, wow, this, this is actually a really nice, fresh, you know, sparkling color. Um, so I think it's good. Some people uh, uh, mentioned uh, noodlers, I think eel turquoise or, or uh, some noodlers turquoise. Um, I don't know that. I don't own it, so I, I can't really compare the two. Um, but I think, you know, if you're looking for an ink that's a little different, but that's still very legible, and that uh, you an ink you can use, you know, for professional purposes, like when, you know, in your job or, or whatever, um, I think this is actually a, a very interesting candidate, because it's it's nice, it's light, it's a little sparkly, but it's still very legible. And it's, it's, it's not too flashy to actually you know, distract or be too flashy. Um, yeah, I love this. The uh, Turquoise are some of my favorite inks. Um, I think I've got, man, probably five or six. Um, I, I don't think I have this exact one. I, I know I've got some Lamy. Um, Noodlers, Visconti. Um, Visconti happens to be my favorite turquoise. I've got like okay. three or four bottles sitting up there. Okay. It, it, it's almost my default ink. I mean, okay, really but, nice. Uh, yeah, it's. I don't know what it is about th those turquoise inks, but man, like the, the color, they just pop. They're so vibrant, yeah. and um, at, at least with uh, Lamy and Visconti turquoise, the, the properties of the ink have always been. It, it, acceptable enough for daily use for me. If I have noticed with Visconti that if you have like a really wet writing pen, it will tend to to feather a little bit, even on like Rhodia. So you do kind of have to watch out for that. But uh, uh, some some of the, my favorite inks are, are turquoise. Absolutely beautiful colors. I I only no wait. I have two Visconti inks. One was just a, a strange plastic bottle, not the regular Visconti bottle. A sort of squarish, strange, ugly bottle I got with a Visconti pen. That was Visconti Black. I like that. I thought it was a little on the gray side, but I think many black inks are, so I, I don't, you know, that, that was somewhat to be expected. I also got Visconti Purple at some point, and I, I actually thought that was a little dry. Um, is it your experience with, with, with the, um, Visconti Turquoise? Is that, is that because it, it sounds like that's more on the wet side, actually? I don't know if I would say it's wet i mean it, it might be it, it's definitely not a dry ink that's, that's okay better. um yeah i think in most pens it, just, it has good flow qualities so right okay so i think we should decide on which ink goes next um now i i came up with uh i don't know why probably it was because i set myself on fire i came up with some yellow inks i thought maybe that will be uh that would be nice. So the, the, the problem is I, I, I kind of dislike yellow inks uh, because generally speaking, I think they're not very legible. Um, and, you know, if an ink is not legible, then, then I don't see the point in, in having that ink. Um, however, uh, sometimes you just get an ink, uh, which, which happened to me. Um, so I got three right here. One of them, I think, is, is fairly legible. And that is uh, Diamine Sunshine Yellow. Uh, I, I only have this much of it left. It's just a sample, so it's it. But it this will get pre-conversion fills enough to, to do the, the encyclopedia. I got uh, Gerbin Bouton d'Or in a nice, cute little bottle. Um, 
I think it's a fantastic color. I think it's very nice yellow, but I just can't read it back when I when I work with it. Um, and finally, I got some Delta uh, Delta yellow. Uh, I got that with the the Dolce Vita. Um, I put it in the Dolce Vita when I got it, and and I thought, okay, this is this is not going to work. It's it's too light, but you know, it's it's an interesting yellow. So I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I hope, I mean, I'll have to see what happens. Maybe if I try to record on a video, you just don't see any ink, but clearly then I'll have to stop and come up with something else. Uh, but, you know, maybe it, it will work. So I'm, I'm not sure whether anyone in the audience has a clear preference or whether you have a preference. I mean, well, talk yeah, to me. I like yellow inks. Um, like, for real yellows, though, yeah, I run into that same problem, as you mentioned, with the, the Delta ink. I would consider that a real yellow, but it's it's very hard to see. I think they almost have to tend to get more into that orange kind of yeah. range before they really start to pop. And one of my favorite inks for that is um, Iroshizuku Yuyake, which is the their kind of yellowish orange a little bit. And I have that in my my Delta Oro um, Dolce Vita, and I, it's a perfect match. I mean, it's it's super bright. It's kind of it's got a little bit of orange in it for sure because it um, you know it it pops. And, and you right. just don't get that with yellow. But um, as far as kind of that color line of inks, that's one of my favorites. I think I may actually, I'm, I may actually have a sample of that too. So I might be able to add that. So if all of this fails, then I, I probably just throw that in and, and see what uh, what happens. Does anyone have any preference, or shall I just make a decision? Well, we had uh, someone in the chat ask for more reds. More reds. Well, it's also possible. You know, I mean, I reds. It's man. It, I don't think anyone has really found an absolute red that they're just happy with. I mean, I know the 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 J Urban 1670 uh, red is a popular favorite, but you know, yeah. it's really expensive. Um, I've actually found a, a pretty good red in uh, Waterman's red. I, it, it's bright and, and it's it's vibrant, but the the qualities aren't that great. I, I tend to notice. Um, I wouldn't so much call it feathering, but it, it definitely makes the edges soft on quite a right. bit of paper, even, even Rhodia, which is, which is, you know, kind of sad, but uh, it, it's a good, <laughs> nice red color. So I don't know. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing a review of the yellow ink. This, uh, this is Ackermann red. Oh, um, very nice. I'm, I'm not sure how well the, the camera picks it up. There's, there's quite some sun uh, going on there. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly do Ackermann Red. This will not be the most available ink for most viewers, I think. Uh, but that, that's, that's fine with me. The Ackermann, it's called Chinatown Red, officially. And that's just what it is. When I think of Chinatown with sort of red lampoons and stuff, well, that's the color you get. So it's, it's a very bright red um, without being, you know, a red could be so bright that it sort of hurts your eyes, so to speak. Um, but this is this is actually a pleasant red that is easy to read, and that's 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 kind of nice. So I can also do that. I I don't really mind. All right. Yeah. Um. My 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 concern with yellow is that people cannot read it, and then it's it's pointless to do a video. So maybe I should just first, you know what? I think this is the best idea. I'll do the Akamon red now. And then I'll just do a test of yellow. If that works out, I can just you know pick any yellow and, and do a video on that. But then at least we have the Akamon coming up, and then we just see what happens with um, you know with yellow. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds awesome. I think you also did an awesome review, didn't you? We did. Um... <laughs> that was smooth, wasn't it? That was very smooth. I, I think we just ruined it by talking about it. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, we did have an awesome review go up, and it was on the Aurora Mar Terreno, and oh my goodness, what a freaking pen. This thing was just, it was mind-blowing to me. I absolutely loved it. Um, of course, there are a few problems with it as far as, you know, details go, and I wasn't, you know, ecstatic with the C theme of the pen, but the color, the feel in the hand, the weight, the writing quality was absolutely top notch. I, I gave it a 10 in the road trip. Perfect 10. I mean, it's like this pen was built for me. Um, right. We announced the this pen a, a few months ago. It's a limited edition from Aurora. There's only 460, I believe, made. They're 
they retail for fifteen hundred dollars street price around twelve hundred i mean it's it's absolute luxury the the presentation from the box is is you know it's it's like opening a treasure chest i mean the, the box is huge it's heavy the pen is magnificent it's Eric liked it pretty well. I, I, too bad he's not here to talk more about it. I'm sure he will next week. But th the biggest problem that we both had with the pen is the nib. The nib is so generic looking. I can't stand it. It has this, you know, like cheap looking scroll work on it. There's a big 18K in the center of the nib. And they, they, they've just got Aurora and little tiny letters at the very bottom of the nib. Like, I don't understand why that is. You know, why wouldn't you have the Aurora logo that's on the top of the cap in the center of the nib. I mean, this is your pen. This, this is a, a, a big pen here. You should be showing off your brand here. Um, Especially show your brand off instead of it being 18 karat. I mean, that, that doesn't really, I mean, it's nice, but it, it doesn't really have to be advertised so, so clearly, I think. Right. And, you know, everything else about the pen, I, I just loved it. it. It felt great in the hand. As, as soon as I started writing with it, um, a lot of those, little issues a lot of those you know nitpicky details I had completely disappeared I, I totally forgot about them it, it's all all I was thinking about was was writing I mean it just felt phenomenal in the hand and man it, it's a good thing I can find something to not like about it otherwise I'd, <laughs> a problem. I'd be selling even more pens to try and get this thing selling a kidney and some pens and then you buy it. <laughs> yeah no that's uh <laughs> I, I of course I, I haven't used it but I, I think the, the, the green looks pretty stunning. Um it's 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 very I mean clearly work went into the design, whether you completely care for it or not. I mean they, they, they did think about what they were doing. Uh, I, I agree with you on the, the nib. I think that's that's too bad. Then again, I could live with a nib that doesn't look so good if it gives such a, a flawless performance. And I seem to, to get that from both Eric and you in the review that it, you really, really love the way it will. Um, so I guess that's it's it's serious nibbage with a twist or something. It's it's for sure. Uh, yeah, um, but you know, very cool. The thing I, I really want to point out about this is um, you know. I know everyone's not going to be able to afford this type of pen. I mean, heck, I can't even afford this, not even close. But take a look, take a second or third or fourth look at pens in your price range that you have passed over. I mean, you know, if, if you can get your hands on them, if you can try them out, if a buddy has some of these pens, use them for a little bit. You know, it, I mean, it took me a little bit to warm up to this pen, but, but once I did, I mean, I absolutely loved it. And I think when, when you find a pen like that, it's – that I think that's a pen that stays in your collection for a long time because of how great of a writer it is to you. So um, I I, I kind of put that in my my final thoughts in the review, and you know I it's not a lot of not a lot of pens can can bring that type of thought out. I think. No, I agree. I agree. Sometimes you you get a you you just get good vibes, you know, with a pen, and it it, it just it just fits from from the moment you, you you use it and and that that doesn't happen with every pen obviously but I, I i know what you mean and i think most most pen users i mean if you have just one pen then maybe you know you need to get some more but there will be a few in your collection if you're lucky that that will just stick and that you will really really hate losing you know it's also a pretty awesome pen something i'm seeing right now what's that i think it's um uh, a Jack Rose, uh, latest piece. Yes. Uh, yeah. Th this pen. He he's actually got two new pens coming out: the Jolly and the City Collections. And I first found out about Jack Rowe from his Architect Collection, and I thought it was a phenomenal pen. It, it won the Rob Reports Best of the Best Award. I mean, you know, that's a pretty sweet title to win. And this newest pen. The Jolly is the the newest collection of luxury fountain pens and cufflinks that are intended to be collectible contemporary treasures. Each piece being handcrafted in England from solid sterling silver and 18 karat gold and set with accents of petrol blue diamonds. Now the inspiration for this collection is drawn from the geometric patterns of Islamic art, which is translated into the Jolly latticed screens characteristic 
of Mogul Indian architecture. And I, I looked this up, the, the, um, the jolly, you know, uh, geometric pattern shape. And I think Jack has, has captured it amazingly well in this design. And then the city collection, it's, it's more of a, you know, a subtle kind of tamed down pen and it's handcrafted from solid sterling silver. It's uh, stylishly minimalist yet discreetly defined with precious gemstones such as diamonds and rubies and sapphires and things like that. Each piece in Jack Rose production is individually made to order. So, I mean, you, you get, um, you can get an amazing level of, of customization with his pens. You know, of course, you're also going to pay for it because just of the amount of precious metals that he uses, you know, precious gems that he uses, and also the craftsmanship. I mean, he uses a lot of uh, lost wax casting techniques. Um, the, 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 uh, the, the gold uh, casting around the pen, he, there's a lot of work goes into the final details and, and shaping and, and polishing of that. I mean, I, I think his work is absolutely spectacular, and I, I don't know what he sells it for, but it, it's probably worth it, I mean, considering what you're getting. It's probably going to be more than $15, I'm, I'm assuming. Uh, and I, I, the, the, the uh, let me see, I, I absolutely agree with you. I mean, a lot of, of, of craftsmanship goes into this and, and you can just, I mean, you cannot not see that. It's, it's, it's really, really beautiful. Having said that, I am not, uh, this is probably just a ridiculous argument. I'm not sure about the the practicality of the pen. Of course, if you buy a pen, you know, you spend this much money, then I, I'm, I'm assuming this will be on your desk and, and you know, uh, will, will impress people. Uh, clearly, they will write. And I don't feel particularly drawn to these pens, apart from the price and apart from me probably not even being able to afford this. But I, I think, I mean, a lot of, you know, respect for, for Jack Road to, in, to, to make this stuff and to make such, you know, innovative things. I mean, I, I, even though I don't particularly care for it, I, I don't recall ever having seen something like this. I think the design is, is unique. And the same goes for the, the, the city collection. That may be a bit more toned down, but even so, I don't think I've, I've ever seen a pen shape like that. So I think these are very, very unique, you know, art objects. And I think that is really, really cool. Right. Yeah. This it would be interesting to see how they actually work, how they actually feel as a pen. Um, but as far as just the shape and the, the technique used to, to create them, I think it's just, you know, kind of out of this world. I think, I yeah. think they're really cool looking. I think that's, that's just the right expression. Yeah. So we, we learned something new this week. We learned a little French. We learned a little French. And who, who was our, our teacher this week? Uh, Professor uh, Mike, I think, from uh, Canada. <laughs> yeah, he he is an interesting guy. Uh, um, you know, once we finally got into the the French part of the lesson, I think you know three and a half or four minutes into the video, it was it was very well done. Um, it was it was entertaining, and I, I can't wait to see see more of these. Um, you know, you you kick things off. Very nice. You gave people, uh, you know, a good. You set the bar pretty high, I should say. And uh, Mike delivered well, and I can't wait to see more. I know we've got plenty of requests to to do more of these, and and we're gonna keep it going as long as we can. Yeah, and I think we got some. I mean, I think we've got. Uh, I think we got Spanish. I think we got Polish, if I'm not mistaken. And I've, I. If I'm not mistaken, I think that the person who uh, volunteered to do Polish is actually a linguist. Um, I'm not sure whether it was Polish. I think it was, but so at least I mean we will have a real linguist working on this, which I think is is you know really cool. Um, so we got Spanish, we got Polish. I think yesterday I sent some email on on German. Yes. Um, uh, a colleague of mine, I think I have sort of coaxed her into uh, doing this in Mandarin. So then we have Chinese fountain pen terms. Wow. So I think this, I, I really, really like this feature. I mean, I think it's it's just a lot of fun. I mean, it's just fun to, to, to watch this stuff in, in different languages. And of course, it's a lot of fun to 
to watch people's creativity in, in making these videos. I mean, Mike's video had a crossbow. There was a crossbow in the video. I mean, that is, I mean, you know, so it's, it's just, it's, it's really, really cool. I, I love this feature. Um, one feature that I, I put up Thursday, I think it was, was Twisby is having a sale on some pens. And you can get it, you know, in case you don't have a 540 yet, this would be the perfect time to get one. Um, Cause we can't use fountain pens for every single thing. Sometimes a pencil actually comes in handy. And so this combination I think is probably perfect. You can get a Twisby 540 and their precision mechanical pencil for 16% off, normally $70 with this combination. And for the sale, it's $58.99. This is part of their, their fall sale. Um, they don't say how long it'll be going, or how many units they have for sale, but you can get either the the blue, the smoke, or the orange 540 with one of their precision mechanical pencils and 0.5 or 0.7 millimeters. The pencils have uh, two versions, either a, a fixed tip or a retractable tip, and they come in uh, three different colors. It looks like a, a burgundy and a, a silver and black, and I'm, I'm very tempted. I mean, I already have two 540s. I don't think I need another one, but you know, just this deal and, and getting a, a pencil with it, you know, for, I mean, eight or nine bucks, it, it's, it's hard not to click the buy button. And I mean, I, I, I think the 540 is my favorite Twisby so far. I'm just thinking hard right now. I mean, I love the, the, the VAC 700. The, the, the filling mechanism is, is, is cool. I mean, there's, there's no doubt there. But when it comes to the actual writing, I, I think, yeah, I think I like the 540 best, and just the overall thing. I mean, I love the Micarta too, and that's all cool, but I, I, I think the uh, the 540 is, is my favorite. And then I, I just have the clear version, but I think these color versions look really cool. And as you say, I mean, you, you, it's, it's a great deal. I mean, mechanical pencil is always useful, so looks like a very nice thing. Yeah, I love yeah, that. I think the 540 is probably the best bang for the buck in the Twisby range. I mean, it's certainly the the probably the single most recommended pen from me to others looking to to get into a quality fountain pen, you know, and, and they have a little bit of money to spend. Yeah, so, yeah, same here. Yeah. Let's okay. See. What should we talk about next? Should we have a look at someone showing off his pens? Yeah, I, I love the daily carry feature. Yeah. Um, just to see what other people are, are carry around on a daily basis. Um, and Will, he's a, a 15 year old kid. Well, I shouldn't call him a kid. He's, he's a young man and he has got an amazing daily carry. Um, he only has five in his collection, but they're pretty stunning pens. He, he has two Pelicans. He has an M400 and white tortoise. He has a Pelican 400 from the fifties. He has a Schaefer triumph crest a Parker Vacuumatic Major, and an Aurora 88, a vintage Aurora 88, which are some of my favorite pens. I, I have had a ton of those. I, I buy them and sell them routinely. They're some of my favorites. Um, Steven, were you able to spot the misidentified pen? Uh, I have to say no. It's, it's probably completely obvious to many people, but in this case, I missed it. So it enlighten me. I don't think it was obvious. Um, I, th I think okay. you have to know vacuumatics pretty well to have spotted it. Um, the the major tends to be a um, uh, I'm blanking on this. It's it's like the, the the vacuumatic had kind of three generations, and it's the the third gen vacuumatic. It was a single jewel pen, and it was a little bit larger than this pen here. This is actually a debutante, so it's pretty much the the smallest pen that, that the of the vacuumatics and it was made in the the 40s it was it was a first gen pen so it's, it's hard to tell unless you kind of know these these vacuumatic details but uh yeah the, the rest of his lineup man i just thought it was a, a stunning daily character i think it's i think it's great and i think it's i, I think we we discussed that before but i think it's it's great that that people of will's age are actually into fountain pens because if, if it would not be for people like that then the whole hobby would just die out um, and I think it's it's great that you know young people are interested in this and are apparently interested in handwriting because otherwise I guess why would you have a fountain pen and not just a you know, <laughs> throw away disposable ballpoint um, 
and I, I, I think it's great, and I think that even though these are just five pens, he's got five beautiful pens, so it's it's um, a very nice nice collection and a very good contribution to the to the the daily carry uh, feature. Um, are you familiar with the the vintage eighty eights at all? Um, I am familiar to the extent that I know they exist, <laughs> but um, I I don't own one, and I, I don't think I've ever used one. So I uh, I need to look into this. Yeah, Eric and I have both been big fans of the vintage eighty eights. Um, he actually got me started on them. Uh, that that was one of his first vintage pens. Um, it's. We, we like to say it, it's everything that Parker 51 should have been. It, it's got a hooded nib. It, uh, it's very easy to find them with flexible nibs. It's a piston filler. It's made. Some of them are made from celluloid and ebonite. Um, they're they're larger than the 51. It's, I absolutely love them. And you know, plus they're Italian. So I mean, yeah, no, which also that. helps. I just uh, I just made a note. And that's uh, my sign of um, you know having to look into something. So that's uh, it, it. Sounds cool. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a huge Barker Fifty One fan. Um, I know that's an, an iconic pen, but it, the, the the design doesn't do a whole lot for me. So it's it, this sounds like something I'll definitely have to explore. What about the design of the Lamy Two Thousand? Does that do anything for you? The design of the Lamy Two Thousand definitely does something for me. I think it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's very fascinating. You know, if if something's been around from 1966 and it's still there, then it must work for people. Uh, and fortunately, we have someone who is very knowledgeable and who is contributing a lot. Right? Wow. Yeah. Uh, on Friday, we published the the fifth of five parts of Brandon's article, and it, it, it focuses on the other families of the 2000 family or the other members of the 2000 family. So this includes the, the ballpoint, the four and one ballpoint, the rollerball, the mechanical pencil, and then the other versions of the Lamy 2000. And I mean, just the, the detail that he goes into the weights, the measurements, you know, usage, all the versions, he has almost a complete collection. I think the ballpoint is the area where he doesn't have all of them yet, just because um, they're the least exciting to him. But I mean, just his his pictures show off everything in detail. It's he's done such an excellent job with these. He he goes into detail about the the two thousand edition Lamy two thousand that was limited to five thousand pieces. Um, he he compares that to the two thousand and the two thousand M. He even has the packaging for the pens. I mean, he's done such an excellent job with this article. And then he finally gives us his his review of the 2000M. It's a fantastic read. It's, it's a little bit longer this week than the others, but I think it wraps everything up just perfectly. And he's given a bunch of other um, reading material in, in case you just haven't had enough Flamey 2000 yet. I think it's fantastic, and one of the things I I really really appreciate in in all of these installments is the <clears throat> sorry is the 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 fantastic photography. I mean, he he really does the pens and and you know small parts justice. It's it's it, this is like you know an encyclopedia of itself, just like me two thousand. And I think that's that's you know this clearly was a lot of work to put together, uh, but it's 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 absolutely fantastic. Yeah, he's. I mean, I, this this article will be the Lamy two thousand reference, you know, for the future. I mean, it it's uh, stickied in our Lamy forum. Um, I'm I'm sure it's stickied in some other forum somewhere else. It, it'll it'll be a feature on our website. I, I'll, I'll make it easy to find um, because you know the information in here is is just too valuable. I mean, w when I recommend this pen to someone. I'm also going to recommend that they read this article, just because it's it's so informative. It, it's so complete. So, yeah, everything's there. I just, you know, just want to thank Brandon for um, sharing that article with us, allowing us to publish it at our website. And uh, I can't wait to see what he comes out with next, because I mean, not only his his technical knowledge and his pictures, but also just the way he writes. Yeah. It's very easy to read, you know. It's engaging. That that really uh, really helps. Yeah. <clears throat> so should we have a look at a year of the snake pen? Sure. Um, are are you into these type of pens? 
Um, well, let, let me let me put it this way: when I when I was looking at the the picture on the website, um, I was studying it, and I think it took me five minutes to realize there's actually a snake on there. Uh, <laughs> so I I guess that, that sort of answers the question. Uh, I think it's a, a very interesting pen. Um, there are some features I really like. I, I, this this sort of metallic blue, I think that's very interesting. Uh, it has these interesting ring band things going on uh, on the barrel and on the cap. Uh, it has a, a very artistic impression of a, a snake. Uh, it's not something I would buy, but it's 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 definitely an interesting pen. What do you think? Well, it's definitely not something I would buy because it retails for four hundred and fifty dollars. Um, I think that's just crazy. But you know, it's uh, I don't know. I think this is a little outside Cross's range. I mean, it, it, when I see this, I, I I wouldn't even come close to thinking this was a Cross pen. But you know, sure. you do get a an eighteen karat gold nib on it, so. Um, I don't know. I guess that might make you feel a little bit better about spending that much on a pen. But but these type of um, special editions, they they don't really do anything for me. There's, um, I, I like the color. I like the blue. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing this um, design w without the snake design in a cheaper price. Just that rhodium and and blue color combination. I think that might be kind of cool. I think that would be very interesting. Yeah, because the blue. I mean, as you just said, I, I think the. The blue is, well, I'm not sure whether it's unique, but it's it, it's definitely appealing. I mean, it's it's a, a, a very interesting blue without being being too obtrusive or anything. So I, I yeah, without the snake, I could actually consider this. I agree. <laughs> the the snake and about a fifty percent discount. Yeah, that definitely. <laughs> then we could start to talk a little. Yeah. All well, right. Let's let's head over to the mailbag now. Yes. As you so are we going? Actually, we're going from snakes to snails now because there's a snail mail. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Uh, as you can imagine, most of our entries are for uh, the, the, the Twisby mini giveaway. Um, we, we do have that little contest going on. So if you haven't sent in your entry, be sure to do that. Um, but we did get one. And maybe maybe we should just point out, since Eric is not here, that he, he never mentions it, but he actually would like to have a mini at some point. I mean, just just so that <laughs> yeah. that's out of the way. Yeah, I yes, think okay. we order one of those. I, yeah. yeah, he may, he may. Okay. Let's so we, we did actually get a piece of snail mail that wasn't intended for the contest. And this little postcard. And th the person who wrote in says, um, hello, FP Geeks, enjoying the latest podcast coming to an end now um because it's time it's kind of hard to form sentences while listening so perhaps i should say that i have enjoyed the podcast it's fun i don't know when i'll be able to enjoy it live as saturday morning is nearly mythical morning appears on saturday are you sure um and she, she wrote this with a pilot parallel 1.5 but uh if you look the, the the lines are very thin she actually used the corner of the oh, pilot really? parallel nib to write this. Uh, I thought that was a little funny, but she did have a question for us. Steven, she wants to know what lives in the cage in Doc Brown's background. She says, I hope it's a dwarf hamster, Cheerios and Fruit Loops is her sign off. So uh, <laughs> thank you for writing in. So Doc, what, what do you got back there? Well, it's it's a genetic experiment in which <laughs> I have crossed over a, a crocodile with a mole just to see what would happen, and it's a, a mocodile, and it just it just makes fun all the time of whatever I say. Now, it's it's uh, in fact um, the, the the lady was very close to the mark. It's a, it's a Syrian hamster. Um, the Syrian hamsters are a bit bigger than dwarf hamsters, which is why dwarf hamsters are called dwarf hamsters. Uh, Syrian hamsters do not wear a little turban or anything. It's not like the Syrian, that, that, that sort of, it doesn't work that way. Um, but they are from Syria, um, and uh, the, the hamster is called Lord Merdelin. And in fact, I think Lord Merdelin has appeared in at least one video, um, which is a shootout. And for the love of me, I cannot remember which one from the top of my head, but if you just go through my shootout videos on YouTube, you will, it's, it's the very beginning, you will find live footage of Lord Merdelin. So, Very there you have it. And we, we did get a couple of email questions in. Uh, the first from Todd says, uh, he's a cartoonist and illustrator, and he's asking for a suggestion of a modern-day pen that is affordable, under $200, 
and can handle rather quick strokes and generous amount of line variation in the process. He's looking, so he's looking for something with flex. And he says vintage pins are out unless they can first be tested. He's, he's had bad luck with the whole eBay thing. Mm -hmm. And specifically, he's looking for an extra finer fine nib that could flex up to a, a broader double broad. So, you know, at, at least semi-flex. He would like it to be an eyedropper fill so, or, you know, at least, you know, to maximize the ink capacity. Um, fairly priced, $200, maximum of 300 and he, he wants to be able to you do faster strokes without it skipping or railroading. So uh, he, he said the, the Noodler's Ahab, you know, is out of the question. He tried that. It, it, it just doesn't work, and he doesn't want to have to fiddle with the pen. So he, he's got quite a few requirements. Um, he's not making this easy, and I, I would say um, if you can get to a pen show because – I mean, it, it'll totally be worth it. You want to make sure Susan Worth is going to be there, and she's at practically every pin show. Her table, you can actually try before you buy, and the, the two to $300 range should fit perfectly. You could probably find one actually a little bit cheaper. Um, she, she has a great selection of Vintage Flex. Um, that, that, that's where I would point you would be to Vintage Flex, um, just because the Flex is so much better, the, the flow is better. Um, there, there are modern pens that can do it, but I, I haven't used any. I, I can't really think of any that's going to fit your recommendation. The, the other place I would turn to would be Greg Manuskin's website because he sells a lot of vintage pens with, with flexible nibs, and he has excellent customer service. If you get a pen and it doesn't live up to your expectations or, or, or what you need it to do, you probably would be able to exchange it for something else. Um, but that that would be my best bet as far as an eyedropper filler. Again, I don't know. I mean, that's going to be difficult, I think. Yeah, I I agree. Um, you know, I I agree with your suggestions. Uh, I think that's that, that's a very good idea. I one pen um, jumps to mind. This is a pen I actually just got uh, literally a few days ago. Um, this is modern made. This is a pen from India. And before you just think, oh, India, no, 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 cheap, 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 don't, but give, give this some a, a bit of a, a chance, I think. Um, this is from a brand called Surwex. I don't think that's a very well-known brand. Um, I got this at fountainpenrevolution.com. And uh, a lot of the pens they sell, uh, this is another Surwex pen, are, are made of, of resin or something. Uh, this is actually a metal pen. And um, Fountain Pen Revolution now sells... Uh, flex nibs, which they didn't do at first, and I actually think that these could be good competition for noodlers' uh, pens. So just to give you an idea, <clears throat> I just did some quick doodling. Um, I would call that flex. Uh, it, it goes from something that is, well, at least fine. I'm not sure whether I would call that extra fine, but it's at least fine. And it goes to a, a definitely, well, at the very least double broad, um, and what I particularly liked about the pen is that it keeps up very well. That was I, I it was very difficult for me to make it railroad. Uh, currently, I have Noodles X Feather in there, uh, but it's it, the the feed kept up really well. Um, <clears throat> I got some other pens with the same nib, including this one by Sir Wax. Um, that one definitely railroaded more. To be truthful, I put another ink in there, so I, you know it's it's not entirely comparable. Um, but I would. I would give this a chance. So this is the Surwex MB. It's called MB because it's it clearly resembles a Mont Blanc pen just a little bit. Um, but it's it's fifteen dollars. That's one five dollars. So if you, I mean, you could at least give it a shot. You won't blow any you know large amounts of money on this. If you don't like it, then it's it's fifteen dollars down the drain. But it, I would I would I would seriously give it a shot. Now the only thing is it's not an eyedropper. Whereas most others are. This one is a piston filler, and, and some of these pens actually are eyedroppers. But they also sell a lot of eyedroppers on the side with these flex nibs. So if you really need that, again, it's it's I'm not affiliated with them or anything, but Fountain Pen Revolution, I think you may find something you like there. Although not, in my experience, not every feed keeps up equally well. This one does. So, just my two cents. Well, that's, that's good to hear. I like that recommendation. Um... So yeah, I hope um, you know that 
we, we kind of got you started in the right direction, Todd. Um, if you do make a decision, uh, please write back and, and let us know yeah. what you went with and, and how it's working out for you. But uh, the, the next one from Rick, he wants to know our opinion on having a nib tuned at a pin show. He, he asked, should I bring the pin inked or not? Does it matter? What's the protocol? How long does it take? Does it cost? Mm -hmm. And if I have three pins that I need done, is that being greedy? Um, yes, it's very greedy. Never do that. Never bring more than one. Uh, uh, did you have any pins tuned while you were in DC? Uh, yes, I, I did. Um, let me think. I had, yeah, I had two pins tuned, um, plus one, I would say, because I, I bought a nib from, from Richard Binder, and when you do that, he just binderizes it and, and, and tunes it. Um, well, I, I'd almost say whether you like it or not. I mean, that's that's a man in a bad way, but it, it's just what happens. You just buy the nib, and then his wife gives it to him, and he would just start working on it, uh, which is, of course, very cool. I mean, if you're there anyway, you, you might as well have that done. Um, I had two pens tuned by Mike Masayama. Uh, one was a Twisby Mikata, uh, which just, uh, it, it was very dry, uh, really very dry. Uh, and I, I just, uh, what, what happened, just to give you a bit of an idea, because that was part of the question, what happens is you just go there and you, you leave your name. His, his wife will write down your, your cell phone number and your name. You just walk around the show. And at some point, you get a phone call and she says, Mike, it's time for you now. So you just sit down. And he, uh, he, he took my Mikata and he says, it's dry, huh? And I said, hey. Uh, yeah, he said. Yeah, I just had another one. So uh, and then he just starts working on it, and he does this, this stuff, and you know, you have nice conversation. What I like is that you can uh, sort of see what he's doing. I, I kind of enjoy you know, watching the master at work, so to speak, and then seeing him bend stuff and 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 you know, cut things. Um, that worked very well, and I I think. I think Eric actually said you had that, that Conway Stewart with you, and that was a bit dry or something. So I, I said, "Oh yeah, that's true." So I just, you know, asked Mike, "Could you do this?" I would have to make another appointment. He said, "No, sure, come on, give it to me." So I gave him that. He he worked on that, and it it was just fine. And um, you will pay. I think he charged something like like twenty dollars for a, a, a nib tuner. He, but he when you leave. Uh... Twenty dollars for a grind, and I think it's like ten for a tuning. Okay. Oh, that's that's possible. That I just, well, it doesn't really matter. So you will pay a bit, but when you walk away, your pen will write, and will probably write the way you like it to write because you can test it and give it back and say, "No, this is not what I meant." And then you know, <laughs> they, they can do stuff. So, um, I I think it's 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 very valuable to to you know if you have pens, you're not really you know, happy about or or whatever. I mean that that Conway Stewart I mentioned. Is a great pen. I absolutely loved it, but it just it just skipped a bit. And you know, Mike works on it for five minutes, and bang, you got a pen that writes. So I would I would go for it. Yeah. Um, to kind of mirror a little bit what you said, I have, my only interaction has been with Mike Masuyama, and I was at the Chicago Pen Shows both times I went. Um, I know Pendleton Brown is at a lot of shows. He does a lot of nib work, and kind of the protocol is um you know you just you just walk up there i i have all my pins inked because after he's done tuning it or adjusting it he will give it back to you to write with so you can tell if um you know if you like it if you don't like it he will adjust it so that you do um but yeah it's you know having it inked isn't a problem um you just kind of sit down and you know just say i mean you know hey mike i got these pins that I would like done. Can, can you do them? I had three pens that I wanted Mike to do. Um, he was able to do one right at the spot, but, but he had kind of a, a long list of clients. So he's like, Hey, can you come back um, a little bit later and I'll do the other two then? And I, yeah, no problem. So we went around, walked the show a little bit, um, came back later and, and he did both of them right there. Um, so, you know, just, just, you know, kind of uh, explain to the, the Nibmeister, what you need done, and, and how many you would like to have done, and, and they're they're very friendly. You'll you'll work something out. It's I mean, it, it's not not a big deal at all. But uh, I I would highly suggest bringing all your pins that you want tuned to the show to have done because you, you get instant feedback. I mean, you he'll tune it, you get it, you write with it, you let him know what you like or don't like, and if he needs to readjust it, he can do it right there. And then you walk away with all your pens tuned exactly the way you want it. And I mean, it, it can turn that pen that you you like to look at, you like to hold, but it doesn't necessarily 
write very well, it can turn it into your favorite pen just because it writes so much better. Yeah, I agree. I, I, so, I mean, just, just go for it. I mean, if you're at a show anyway, you know, you might as well, you know, have, you don't necessarily have to buy all kinds of new pens. You might as well have someone who's knowledgeable work on the pens you do like. And, and just what you said, you, you maybe just like to look at because they didn't perform exactly the way you want them to perform. And after the show, they will. So I, I think it's a very valuable thing to do. Yeah. So speaking of shows where we usually acquire pens, um, we've kind of been on a little kick where we've been acquiring pens outside the show. Um, I know Eric has, has got a new pen this week, but I'll, I'll wait and let him tell us next week what that was. Um, Steven, have, have you bought anything? Because I haven't actually bought anything for the last two weeks. I, I've been kind of in a, a selling mood. I've, I've sold five or six pens. Well, I got, I got two things I can show you. Um, I'll, I'll start with something funny. Uh, look at this. What do you think, what brand do you think this is? Um, it, it, it's a little reminiscent of Delta. Isn't it? Yes. Uh, this is a, a Chinese pen, uh, which I got for 99 cents. And um, it's, it's, I, I thought it was just cool. I should probably just show this. <laughs> if I reach around here, I can grab a Delta Dolce Vita. Um, now, if you look at these two pens, then you will see uh, some resemblance there. Um, I, I thought it was just interesting. I wanted to feel what, what, what this pen would be like. Uh, all I can say is the nib required a little bit of work, but right now it's, it's pretty smooth. Um, it's funny. They, they claim it's uh, celluloid. Uh, th really? That's, of course, really realistic, uh, but it's, it's kind of funny. It's actually a little see-through, so I can, I, if I hold it up to the light, I can see the converter in there. Uh, there is something that probably should look like filigree and I think that's just silver on black plastic or something um, but it's you know it's it's not bad if, if you I, I think if you you know you would really like to have a Delta but you can't afford it this is by a brand called Yiren Y-I-R-E-N um, you know it's 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 not at all a bad pen it's uh, kind of funny now the other thing I got I saw that and I think this is probably the tackiest pen I have ever seen, uh, and I had to have it. This is another Chinese pen. It's by Jin Hao, which is a brand I actually like, and it's got a dragon on there. I'm, I'm sure my camera won't focus, but the clip, um, this is a dragon. I mean, it's a pen with a dragon. That's all I'll say. The dragon has red eyes. They're, they're very small. It looks like it's, it's, it's rubies, clearly. This costs 99 cents, so I don't think they're actually rubies. Um, it also has a very interesting texture, which you probably can't see very well. Uh, the texture you don't actually feel because it's completely smooth, so I guess it's, it's laminated in some kind of some way. Um, but, I mean, it's a gold pen with a dragon. I mean, what what more can I say about that? It's just strange but cool. So that's my acquisitions. Very cool. Um, ho hopefully, I'll have something new in the coming weeks that I that I can show off. Um, I'm I'm kind of you know not not in so much a buying phase right now, but uh, and I really can't wait until Eric comes back to tell us what he got because did do you know what he got? I saw a picture and I I. My eyes are sort of like, oh, oh. but it's it's uh, it's going to be very interesting, I think. Yeah, we should have him talk about that. And if you would like to know, you can follow us on Twitter, twitter.com slash fpgeeks, where um, did I don't I think he posted it to his personal account, but uh, we'll retweet it. So if you want to find out what it was, check us out there. You can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash fpgeeks. Um, fpgeeks.com, our forum, fpgeeks.com slash forum. You can email us at podcast at fpgeeks.com. We also have a phone number. You can leave us a message at 415-685-GEEK. That's 415-685-4335. We've not had a message in forever, so someone please call leave us a message. And we also have a mailing address, Fountain Pen Geeks, P.O. Box 728. Ankeny, Iowa, 50021. And all of that information can be found at our contact page at the website. So, Stephen, do you have any last words? 
not really. I think this was a great show, and I'll promise that next week I won't set myself on fire. <laughs> well, if you do, at least do it on air. Yeah, I, that was that was my second thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So th thanks for watching, everyone. We'll see you next week. Bye.